Uh, hi, I'm David. Oh, sorry. Uh, hello, I'm David Goad, uh, and I'm going to be introducing our speaker today. But first, a couple of announcements. Uh, first, if you have any questions, please leave them in the YouTube chat, and we will get to them at the end of the talk. And the second is that uh, I would like to invite you to join us for the uh, reception after the talk, where, where you will get a chance to talk more with Kurt, and you should have already gotten a, a Zoom link for that. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Kurt Peterson. Uh, he recently joined us in the Kellogg Lab over at the Danforth Center uh, back in January. Uh, and he's been working on a, a mix of things, including assembling chloroplast sequences and looking at the evolution of ONS and particularly, particularly the environmental factors that influence that, particularly fire. Uh, before that, uh, he actually came to us from Australia, where he worked as a uh, uh, a surveyor looking at uh, uh, the impact of uh, construction on uh, potentially endangered species in the area. And uh, he did his PhD at Monash University in the laboratory of Dr. Bird, uh, Dr. Martin Bird, where he worked on uh, the evolution of heterospory in land plants, which is what he's going to be speaking to us more about today. So, uh, Kurt, take it away. Yeah. Share that. Hopefully that is visible on the stream. It's all good. Um, so what I want to talk about today is the questions that we thought about when thinking about heterospory. It was a major evolutionary event in the land plants, but for the most part has been very seed plant focused. So throughout my PhD and some later research, we continued to ask questions about heterosporin's origin and some of the non-seed plants, how they interact with the environment and how heterosporia affects that. How I will start though is by talking about what a spore actually is to help anybody who's not too familiar with the non-seed plants. So a spore is the dispersal unit of non-seed plants it contains the gametophyte. The gametophyte is the haploid stage of the, of the adult um, plant life cycle. Um, in bryophytes, that's the dominant adult stage. And in lycophytes and ferns, that's the um, only within the spore part of the cycle and much more reduced. A spore can be unisexual or it can be bisexual. And they can range from 10, 15 microns, all the way up to a thousand microns or more. And that picture there is one I've just taken of some microspores of a herpesia, which is a lycophyte. So then what is heterospory? So heterospory is when spores diverge into two distinct sexually um, differentiated and size distinct spores. The egg producing spore, which is much larger, is called the megaspore. And Megaspores tend to be over the size threshold of around about 200 microns. This is a pretty arbitrary size threshold, and some megaspores are around about 180. But generally, it's a good rule of thumb. If you find a spore and it's over 200 microns, it's probably going to be a megaspore, when, particularly when looking at um, lycophytes. And the sperm producing spore is called the microspore, and is much smaller, between 15 to 80 microns. The bottom picture here, you can see the, the size difference. This is a photomicrograph I took of a, um, a large megaspore from a sludgenella and the microspore right next to it. And you can see that huge size disparity. And this megaspore is, is around about six, six or 700 microns. The other feature of heterospory is the fact that the haploid gametophytes are retained within the spore. So they don't grow out of the spore and become a photosynthetic unit. They develop within the spore and they don't leave that spore. And that's termed en endospory. The other thing about heterospory is that it releases the conflict um, between male and female function in the dispersed units. Because in homospory, in the, when you have the two sexes within the same unit of dispersal, Selection can't really act on male or female function independently because they're in constant conflict with each other. 
what female function, what is advantageous for female function isn't necessarily advantageous for male function and vice versa. And just knowing these small things about heterospore just raises some questions. Why are megaspores so much larger? What advantage does heterospore offer over homospore? And what is the adaptive significance in the environment of heterospore? So the ancestral spores were all thought to have been homosporous. So homosporous spores are simply bisexual spores that produce both archegonia, which is the egg producing organ, and the antheridia, which is a sperm producing organ on that same gametophyte. All the bryophytes, some of the lycophytes, and most of the ferns are homosporous. However, within these groups, some of them have the ability to regulate sexual expression um, and this is done through hormones and other related chemical responses. However, the size does not change between male and female spores. And this sexual, this sex regulation occurs post development of the spore size. So this is um, just an examples of the major groups to make it a bit more visual and less boring. You've got the the bryophytes, liverworts, hornworts, and mosses that are all homosporous. You have the lycophytes, which are heterosporous or homosporous. This is a lycopodium, which is homosporous. And you got the ferns, which are vastly homosporous, but there is some water ferns, which are heterosporous, and this is a homosporous fern. For anybody unfamiliar, all seed plants are heterosporous, except they are so much further down the evolutionary path that they're not very useful in regards to trying to understand the origin of heterospory because they don't represent anything that existed early on in land plant evolution. And as a refresher for the life cycles, we have two simplistic diagrams here. The left one is a pretty good example of, say, a lycophyte homosporous life cycle. You have their bisexual isospores. They produce the bisexual gametophytes which then produce sperm and egg on the same gametophyte. They either breed with themselves or other nearby um, spores and gametophytes, produce a zygote, embryo, sporophyte, and repeat the process. In heterospores, the differentiation is we now have megaspores and microspores, which produce the female and the male gametophytes separately. And the sperm and the egg are separated and meet either from neighboring spores from the same parent or from dispersal into another population produces zygote embryo and the adult sporophyte again. I guess I should mention that the sporophyte in the lycophytes and um, in the, the diploid sporophyte in lycophytes and ferns is the dominant stage while again as I said earlier haploid gametophyte is a dominant stage in the bryophytes. So where did we first start to see heterospore? It appears in the fossil record approximately around the Devonian. And if you follow the, the spores throughout the fossil record, you see they slowly increased in size. And then there's an apparent split where you have small ones and larger ones that occurs, which we basically see in modern plants. And interestingly, heterospory seems to evolve independently multiple times throughout the land plant history, not only through the Devonian. This um, diagram by Sharla, where he investigated um, fossil spores, shows that for the Silurian, spores start off quite small and they slowly become larger and larger and larger for the Devonian. We start to have a separation of larger spores occurring and appearing and spreading out. And by the time we get to the Carboniferous, we have this break at the 200 micron threshold. There's not really many after that, and we have lots of large ones. And this Westphalian Carboniferous example is basically what we see in, in modern plants. And then this diagram by Bateman and DeMichel in a 1994 review shows all the approximate locations of, uh, of events where um, new heterospory evolutions occurred. So it's up to 11 different independent events, the vast majority of which have gone extinct, interestingly. Um, 
if it offers such an advantage, you would have thought that maybe more of them ha would be excellent. But it's still interesting that we have so many events of evolution occurring independently, suggesting that heterosporic offers some advantage um, strongly enough over and over and over again that this trait keeps re-evolving. And heterosporia itself in the literature, from particularly from an adaptive perspective, has had very little attention. The anatomy, um, the fossil history is very well documented, but trying to understand uh, its adaptive evolutionary history is, is, is poorly recorded. Bateman and DeMichel in 1994 did a really good review um, and they tended to define and discuss what's known about heterospory from a more evolutionary perspective. But other than this, it's generally ignored as an innovation in itself. And this is partly because of its odd relationship with the sea. What seems to have happened over the past 150 years is that every time heterospory is mentioned in an evolutionary perspective, it's linked as a step or an iteration to the seed rather than innovation within itself. And this kind of started around when Hofmeister pointed out the similarities between the selaginella and the conifers, noting that the embryo sac of the conifers may look like the sporangium that you see within selaginella. Hofmeister obviously did not intend this. He was just pointing out the similarities. But this point onwards, you have endless papers pointing out this transitional similarity, but not talking about heterospore in itself and what it means. You have Sacht in 1887 stating it establishes a transition to the phanograms, phanograms being seed plants. Coulter in 19, 1898, again, notes that it's one of the most important contributions to land plan progress. However, he then states it to be the natural outcome, being the seed. Charlenard and Petit um, noted its progression from homospory to the seed, skipping heterospory altogether in their descriptions. And some of these papers have names such as the inevitable seed, skipping these steps in between. I have an endless list of papers quoting where people have treated heterospore in such a way. If you are interested to read more about some more of those quotes and some more of the historical perspective, um, I published this review uh, with uh, Martin Bird in 2017. And it's quite in depth and an interesting read, I think. So now we know a little bit about the history, we're going to approach the question. What drives dispersal units to separate into sexually distinct units initially? And the approach we took to this is to look for um, potential homologies in the literature from other systems. And anisogamy is potentially a really good example of this. So anisogamy is the sexual size differentiation of gametes, which occurs in algae, animals, etc. It's been modeled and studied extensively. Um, and I have some good examples from Togashi recently in 2007 on algae. And heterospory itself has actually had a theoretical model uh, produced by Hagen and Westerby in 1989, which is actually quite a good model, um, which suggests that spores increased through time to a certain size threshold until it was advantageous to split into the two size differentiations and sexually distinct um, groupings. Uh, that's a very simple way of explaining it, but if you're more if you're interested in that model, I can link people to the paper. So anisogamy, um, when looked at by Togashi, 2007, noted that anisogamy occurs at a more extreme level in the deeper and darker habitats. So as you go deeper in water, you lose light nutrients and anisogamy becomes the preferable reproductive system. As you move towards the, the shallow upper waters, isogamy becomes more and more common um, as there's more nutrients, um, mostly being light, 
And actually in between, you get these weird transition species where they're kind of halfway between and an isogamy and isogamy. And this suggests that separating the sexes gives some more resilient advantage to the female dispersal units in these darker or potentially more risky habitats. And these aquatic comparisons that we get from an isogamy may be really relevant to these heterosporous groups we have because most of them are actually aquatic, uh, which includes isoides and all of the water ferns. So within the extant free-sporing heterosporous plants, they're all aquatic except for selaginella. Isoides is a bit of a weird one because it does have some terrestrial species, but they're vastly aquatic or living within ephemeral habitats. Marsilia and Sylvinia, the water ferns, um, are completely aquatic. So selaginella is actually the most species rich group of all the free sporing heterospores of around about 600 species. And they're a great little group to look at because not only are they terrestrial, so they're more easily accessible, is that they're, they occur in most environment types around the globe, including arid zones, wet rainforests, etc. And they vary in their morphology greatly. Just a few more pictures I've taken across. This is a this kind of classic selaginella you get on dry rocks, which is tighter, more spiky, resilient looking plant. And then you get these delicate small plants growing deep under the canopy in these wet areas. Selaginella reproduce from these um, stroboli, which produce um, sporangium under these small uh, microfills and sporophylls. The spores are then released from the different sporangiums being megasporangiums for megaspores and microsporangiums for microspores. Um, some species can flick these out mechanically, other ones will just drop them out and blow around. Um, the dispersal strategy varies quite a bit. And selaginella is a good model group because as you see, there's a really good um, collection history um, throughout the herbaria of the world and they're really well distributed. There's a bit of a sampling bias going on in Scandinavia. I'm not really sure why they, they really love collecting selaginella up there, but they do. And you see that generally speaking, selaginella has done a good job at entering the arid desert zones, particularly in the Americas and, and a bit in the African regions. And through Asia, not so much in Australia, they haven't really had any evolutionary events that have moved them into arid zones here, but the resurrection trait of selaginella or the resurrection plants, they tend to be called, gives them a really big advantage in growing in these arid zones. So with Sleginella and knowing what we know about anisogamy and early Devonian habitats, we hypothesize that Sleginella growing in these darker, more competitive environments such as rainforests would likely have larger megaspores or a more extreme ratio of heterospory. So to approach this, we collected spore size trait data and morphometrics, global environmental data sets, and phylogenetic information so that we could adjust for phylogenetic relationships. The paper that this was based on is um, this one here, and it was done with myself and Martin Bird again. Firstly, the herbaria that we collected the spore trait data from was mostly the Smithsonian in DC. They have a particularly good collection of lycopods. And we also collected from the National Herbarium of Victoria. What we did is we, we gently removed the spores from the sporangiums on the, on the sheets and placed them on slides in the water and photo, photo micrographed all the different microspores and megaspores um, for as many as we can get away with doing. And you can see you get pretty good imagery out of this with these spores. And you can see the substantial size difference. This one's 500 micron scale bar again, 100 micron scale bar again. So these are about 20, 30 microns. But we also collected all of the homosporous things while we were at it. The environmental data was mostly um, got collected from NASA. Uh, and this included leaf area index. Um, leaf area index is A up the top left here is the density or the reflectivity of um, 
of green leafy plants, basically. So there's the tropical regions, are, the darker regions stand out a lot because they are a lot denser and reflecting a lot of the light. The second one is net primary productivity. So this is the carbon absorption or release of the environments that they're in. It moves down negative on the scales here is the number is the letter B. It follows a pretty similar pattern, except because this is an average of the year, the areas that are deciduous don't have that consistent productivity throughout the whole year. And C is a distribution of the specimens that we actually used in this study for these environmental value estimations. So quite a good distribution of sludge across the world. <clears throat> so the phylogeny that we use to analyze the traits across the tree was a gene tree that was constructed from GenBank data using RBCL, which is the chloroplast uh, photosystem gene. The tree was built in uh, the Bayesian phylogenetic software package BEAST, and the final tree contained 120 species of selaginella. The analysis was done using a phylogenetic generalized least squares analysis, and both leaf area index and net primary productivity has strong effects on the data, but at different levels, which is quite interesting. So LAI is much more important to spores in higher MPA, MPP LAI areas, but MPP was a much more important factor to spores in the lower MPP and LAI areas. So what we did was we analyzed the data in two parts. And what we found is that microspores in high LAI areas, which represent dense closed forests, have much smaller spores. But you get much larger megaspores in these same habitats. So as we get these dense, dark environments, we start seeing larger megaspores occurring. Interestingly, we also get the small ones occurring at the same time. So we get both large and both smallness in, this, in these areas, which suggests some type of niche overlap um, or niche availability appearing. However, at the low LAIs, because the spores interact with MPP, it is much better explained by that. So if we look at the MPP, we find that in the high MPP regions, so up in these areas here, it was, it's quite messy and not well explained, which was better explained by LAI. But if we look at the low MPP, you get these really nice, consistent patterns occurring. And what we find, which is really interesting here, Note that these are the actually the adjusted residuals, but what we get is these interesting pattern that early on at really low NPP, we have a slight increase of megaspore size, which decreases down to a point, and then LAI takes over and they become large again. And microspores in particular uh, are much more simple in this regard at the top here, is that they're, they're larger in the low MPP areas, the dry open habitats, and become smaller as you, as you um, head towards these high MPP LAI habitats. So in regards to the low values, the low values indicate dry open habitats and low, which are low, have low productivity, so arid, generally arid zones. These environments have larger microspores and tend to have moderately larger megaspores that decrease as you slowly go up and before increasing again. And the thought, um, the explanation for this, which is supported by the literature, is that a larger spore has a higher surface to volume ratio, potentially protecting them from desiccation. However, as you move out of these really dry habitats, which is explained by the initial uh, larger spores, desiccation resistance becomes less important. And LAI, which is part of wetter and more closed environments, becomes a more important factor. And this same pattern is seen in bryophyte spores and fungi spores. Within the higher values, you get 
a mix of large and small megaspores. But in these high value regions, you get these huge megaspores, which progressively get larger and larger that never occur in these low LA areas. And because you also get these small ones occurring with the gigantic and large megaspores at the same time, it suggests that there's more niche availability um, and two different regeneration niches occurring there. And the small microspores are strongly correlated with high LAI. Um, they decrease quite a lot and significantly as you move into these closed environments. Um, and this is probably best explained potentially by filtering effects of vegetation, spider webs, and other natural obstacles. So one thing to note about these larger spores that are occurring in these deep, dark, nutrient poor habitats in regards to light is that megaspores actually contain nutrient stores that are only used by the developing sporophyte, so the, the adult plant as it grows in earlier stages. The gametophyte does not take advantage of these energy stores whatsoever. So in a way, megaspores appear to fun function like ancestral seeds as the adult, the parent plant provisions for the germinating um, sporophytes. And I think this is a good point, a good time to look at this in a historical perspective. So heterospory first appeared in the Devonian when the vegetation was becoming more complex. So before heterospory appeared, we had very simplistic ecosystems, low plants, not much um, species diversity. But when we see this heterospory first appearing in this fossil record, you're getting these more complex, complex environments starting to occur. And interestingly, the arborescent lycopods, the relatives of Isoides and Slugenella, were huge trees and had megaspores way over two mil in size sometimes, and were even developing integument-like structures. Unfortunately, this group was basically wiped out by a climate change event, um, but they appear to have been moving in the same direction as the modern seed plants. Potential arguments to this um, larger seed size, larger spore size for nutrients and establishment is that heterospory function as an inbreeding avoidance mechanism. However, this doesn't really hold up because homosporous plants have evolved very simple methods to avoid inbreeding. And homosporous plants and the lycophytes and ferns from a lot of the research that I've looked through tend to inbreed less than the heterosporous counterparts. They can control unisexuality um, using antherogens and hormones. And heterospory doesn't actually prevent selfing from um, the same plant. It only prevents selfing from the individual spores. And what you actually find a lot of the time when you are looking at a megaspore under the microscope is that microspores from that same plant have been bumped and shook off onto that megaspore anyway. So the other thing I want to talk about is that in this, in that first Sledgenella study, we suggested that the reason we were seeing this, this large increase in size with this underlying small, continuing small size is that there's that the niche regeneration availability um, is increasing in those habitats. So one way to kind of understand if this is a good explanation is to look at how much these large species overlap with other species compared to the smaller species. And this was a paper done in joint with a um, biogeographer, uh, Ross Gleegale and myself and Martin Bird again in 2019. And what we see is generally speaking across the globe, more overlap occurs in these, these dense uh, wet forest regions. And that's not surprising because Selaginella in general is a tropical plant. Um, it has drier diversity, but is still very dominant in the tropics. For example, we've got approximately 600 species and 85 of them occur on Borneo alone. But what we found when we investigated this niche overlap is that megaspores follow this pattern extremely well. Um, we used a quantile regression to examine this, this wedge pattern that occurred, but larger species 
overlap more often with more things than the small species overlap with other things. Saying, suggesting that these big spored things are within mixing with other stuff, so there's multiple species within that same habitat and all multiple regeneration niches potentially. Microspores show no pattern of this whatsoever, which isn't particularly surprising because their their sizes are relatively consistent. And within the same habitat, they don't change all that much. So at this point, we were wanting to look at Isoides as well, and rather than just Legionella. Although Selegionella is, is the more preferable model system, um, Isoides is an interesting group because it is aquatic and produces very, very large megaspores. So it potentially is a really good comparison to anisogamy. So what we did with this group is we tested for correlation between their habitat, habitat type and their spore traits. But as, as, as Isoides is an aquatic, we hypothesize that the water depth or their aquatic habitat type will be the most important environmental factor compared to something like um, leaf area index. The Isoides are slightly different to Slaginella that their sporangium is located in the base of their leaves. It's not up at the ends as, as a open dispersed land to the air. And I don't particularly know, I can't confirm why they do this. It may just be that if they're in the water, the water current releases the spores, they don't necessarily need to release them into the air column. But you can see the mega spores here clearly within the sporangium, little, little dots spread around. And this is a micro sporangium here with the dense, denser looking material. So again, we use the spore size data collected from the herbarium specimens. And we built two gene trees from RBCL and the ITS 5.8 regions. I was curious to see how much the chloroplast, uh, a chloroplast gene tree and a, a nuclear gene tree varied. And also there was much less genetic, uh, genetic material available for Isoides, so it was a bit more difficult to get a large tree built. Is this something that I, I want to go back to and see if there's um, more data available now? We then categorized Isoides habitat types by collecting habitat information from herbarium specimen sheets. So unfortunately, the, the best possible data here would have been water depth or some type of measurement to tell us how long these water bodies last for, if they're permanent, if they're seasonal, et cetera, and get an actual quant uh, quantifiable measurement of this. However, Isoides are particularly rare group of plants, they're cryptic, and they tend to grow in extremely um, hard to get to places like top of mountains in weird little ponds and things like that. So it was just not practical. But what we did is we individually went and categorized these from the herbarium descriptions, and then we cross-referenced our descriptions and what we thought they were, and unless we found a conflict in our descriptors and then tried to find more evidence to try classify these plants. We then used a phylogenetically adjusted ANOVA to compare these groups. The categories were ephemeral, meaning a water body that does not last, so a temporary pool, a permanent aquatic lakes and streams, rivers, terrestrial, um, so just living on land. These are much more uncommon, and plustral, uh, being slightly wet on the edge of wetlands and things like that. These two groups are very small in the Isoides data set. The vast majority of them are growing in ephemeral water habitats or are permanent aquatics. So when we phylogenetically adjusted the mean spore diameters and compared with the ANOVA, we found only one thing, and that was that aquatic, permanent aquatic plants are significantly larger, have significantly larger megaspores on average than any other group. The plustral, plustral and the terrestrial is not surprising because the data set on those two is so small as it's a very uncommon strategy in Isoides. 
But it was very interesting to see that the aquatic things that live permanently in these underwater habitats have much different um, establishment strategies and different size spores to the ephemeral things that have to grow fast, put spores into the soil bank and reappear the next time it rains. The microspores, however, showed no difference whatsoever across these categories. I included this tree that describes the different, the different habitats by colors. And you can see that these habitat types are pretty well distributed across the tree. It occurs relatively randomly, but there is clusterings of phylogenetically related things who have taken similar paths to what type of habitat they are. Like. Blue being the aquatic things, red being the ephemeral, brown being plustral and green being terrestrial. We expect blue and red to often be close to each other because they're both essentially aquatic habitats, but one is just temporary. Then a movement from blue or red to brown is somewhat expected, but we don't really expect a jump from blue to green straight from aquatic um, to a terrestrial environment. But overall, it seems like Isoides appears to follow that similar trend as Sludgenella. And it supports a hypothesis that heterospory is favored in these dark competitive environments. So things that are in these, these deeper waters where there's less light availability, establishment may be more difficult. You get these larger spores. And on average, Isoides spores, megaspores are large and much larger than Sludgenella. You get it up over a thousand microns much more often. And interestingly, quirky thing about Isoides is that they've also, a lot of them have also evolved CAM photosynthesis, which is quite peculiar. So the, the other thing that comes from all of this heterospory questions and the, the occurrence of heterospory is that now sex allocation becomes much more important in the dispersed units and the production and allocation of resources to the different um, sex functions. In the sea plant literature, it always, almost always shows a very biased allocation of resources to female function. Um, myself and Martin Bird published a paper on this looking at how odd Sliginella is in, in, the, um, in sex allocation in 2018, if anybody's interested to read further on that. And how we did that is we, we, we explored the uh, resource allocation by counting and measuring megasporangia and microsporangia. So the megasporangia are basically um, sacs that hold four to eight megaspores um, when they develop. Uh, the number varies depending on how many times they split in their initial development. And the megasporangia is a small sac that is full of thousands of um, small male spores. And we did that over 14 different species that represented four different continents across the world. We then used this data to measure and calculate the volume of sporangia. We also removed megaspores from the sporangia, measured those individual megaspores and used them to clarify if our estimation of megasporangia volume is accurate to the amount of actual space taken up by the megaspores within the megasporangia, and it was quite consistent. And what we found, which is really interesting in this group, is that males' sex allocation is very high. These plants are putting a lot more allocation and resources into male function, which is very, very different and opposite to what you see in a lot of the seed plants. With the exception, with the exception of um, Sludgenella longipinna, which is a, um, a tropical Australian species, the vast majority of all these plants that we sampled sit very, very far to the male um, bios resource allocation. Each of these dots represent an individual plant. So in review to this, heterospory offers 
appears to offer an advantage to establishing spotter fights in the, more, in the more complex and competitive environments. And we know that heterospory appeared in the Devonian when land plants were becoming more complex in their ecosystems. A time where we would expect a, a trait like heterospory if it offers the advantage that we think it does to be selected for. And the other major part of this is that heterospory allows resource allocation and selection to act differently on the two sexually distinct dispersal units. Okay. Questions? So just a reminder to everyone that you can uh, enter your questions in the YouTube chat. Um, so uh, while we wait for people to type their questions, I have one. So uh, did you see any plasticity of uh, megaspore size in the ephemeral uh, habitats, uh, depending on how wet it was? at any given time? Like, did they fluctuate? Uh, the size of the spores is relatively consistent. You get a variation of around about 100 microns sometimes, um, which varies within a species. But it doesn't tend to vary more than that. So if you have a 450 micron average species, you may see 100 to 80 microns swing in either direction in size. Um, but you also sometimes randomly get these smaller ones that are likely infertile occurring. There's an extra um, event in the splitting of the development. I have another question. Um, do you notice any geographic differences? I know there's a lot of, for example, uh, lycophytes that grow in the neotropics. Um, some of the research done by like Weston Testo. Um, I'm wondering if you see any uh, differences in geographic bias uh, for heterospory in terms of uh, many of these ferns and lycophytes. In what regard? Because the larger spores tend to almost appear in the tropics due to the um, the, deep, the more high LAI environments. Right. Uh, I mean, differences in paleotropics versus, versus neotropic. Not really. The distribution is basically the same across there. Wherever they're in the tropics, their spore sizes are relatively similar size. Although some of the really, really large Selaginella in particular seem to occur in South America but I haven't sampled every single species of Selaginella, so I don't know. That would probably be an unfair generalization. Thanks. We have another question in the chat. Um, Rachel asks, other than Australia, where else have you collected samples? We collected samples in Panama, um, in Singapore, uh, uh, and then for live specimens. And then we collected the rest of the live specimens in Australia, but otherwise the other specimens were all herbarium things. So by being in the herbarium from around the whole globe. Actually, I forgot one. We got them from Malaysia as well, sorry. And one thing to note is that Malaysia seems to be a hot spot for diversity for lycophytes. And was that in peninsular Malaysia or in Borneo? Both. <laughs> 
Uh, you mentioned that there were several competing alternative hypotheses, and, and you talked uh, quite a bit about uh, inbreeding avoidance, which you know, I, I agree with you doesn't seem all that likely. Uh, could you maybe speak? Uh, I'd be curious to hear what some of the other ones are. Some of the other ones were to do with uh, cytoplasm and other smaller things that I can't remember. I'd have to read back through my notes to look at them, but I didn't take much notice of them at the time because a lot of them just had absolutely no underlying evidence to support them. Um, mostly the, the other underlying hypotheses that exist have been mentioned once or twice in papers here and there and have zero attempt to actually expand on them. Um, the inbreeding is the only other thing that people have attempted to argue in the literature. That's why I pointed out specifically. Matt has a question. Uh, he asks, how difficult is it to remove and image spores from herbarium specimens? And should any special considerations be kept in mind? The Sledgenella are quite easy. You can just kind of bump them and the spores will fall out. Uh, it's pretty difficult to keep the megaspores and the microspores separate sometimes uh, because when you bump them, the microspores tend to spray the spores everywhere. Oh, the microsporangium tend to spray the microspores everywhere. Um, Isoedes is much more difficult because you don't have that nice exposed stroboli and you actually have to cut open the plant um, and cutting open herbarium sheep plants is tends to not be something that herbaria like you doing, but you have to do that. So you can gently slice open with the razor blade and extract the spores from the sporangium that way. But generally speaking, it's quite a simple process. It's just time consuming. Uh and unless some more questions roll in, I think this will be the last one before we go into the breakout rooms. Uh, Rachel asks, uh, what piqued your interest to research heterospory? Um, I generally just like any evolutionary question that asks, why is this trait here and what adaptive advantage does it offer to the organism? It was brought up as a question by my supervisor originally, and I thought this is really interesting and I jumped straight into it. And uh, I guess uh, one more question uh, also from Rachel. Uh, and she says, uh, what was your hypothesis again about isoedes? We hypothesize that isoedes that grew in, in deeper water habitats would have larger megaspores or a higher, more extreme level of heterospore recurring compared to things in the shallow water habitats or terrestrial things. All right, um, I guess that will close it for questions. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Peterson for sharing your research um, and we can now convene uh, in the breakout rooms for an online reception.